thee, O Lord, for enlightenment. As we are beginning, Father, another book of First Peter in the epistles to the Christian believers, so Lord, we beseech thee, Father Almighty, to open our wisdom, to open our hearts to the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. We thank you for this opportunity that we have in thee, O Lord. At the end of this study, Father Almighty, let us be richly enriched in your word and have every cause to glorify your holy name. As we thank thee, O Lord, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Uh, good evening. The, we are so blessed in Manzayon Fellowship Church that uh, God is really using us and um, we successfully finished the book of James and today we shall be embarking on the study of the uh, book of uh, First Peter and um, there are a lot of things that uh, we shall be discussing tonight about the Apostle that is called Peter. What makes up what makes Peter to be a unique man? What set Peter apart from among all the other disciples? And before we start uh, on the introduction to the book of uh, First Peter, I would just like us to just read first of all the the uh, whole chapter of um, uh, that chapter one. First Peter chapter 1 and then see uh, to prepare our mind to, to what we are going to study tonight. The book according to First Peter chapter 1 verses, verses 1 to the end. The letter from Peter an apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm going to read from the New Living Bible because that one seems to, to have more um, interpretation than the KIV. It said, I am writing to God, to God's chosen people who are living as foreigners in the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. God the Father knew you and chose you long ago and his spirit has made you holy. As a result, you have obeyed him and have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. May God give you more and more grace and peace. Then he starts from verse 3, the hope of eternal life. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectations and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. So, be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold, so when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You love him, even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him. And you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy the reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. We stop there at verse 9. Then we continue from, from verse 10 next Wednesday. 
James started with this letter from Peter. He said, from Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Apostle of Jesus Christ. This is the title. The title has always been identified as most general epistles like, like John, like uh, James, like Jude, they always put their name first. So the name of the author, Peter, and with the notation that it was his first inspired letter. We have never read or heard that um, Apostle Peter has written any other book, but this is the first inspired letter written by him. Now, when with the author or the date, the opening verse of the epistle claims it was written by Peter who was clearly the leader among Christ's apostles. The Gospel writers emphasizes this fact that by placing his name at the head of each list of apostles, as we read in Matthew 10, Mark 3, Luke 6, Acts 1, and including more information about him in the four Gospels than any other person other than Christ. So in other words, what we are saying is that there's no other place in all the four Gospels, the name of Apostle Peter is mentioned almost everywhere, more than any of the other 12, 11 disciples, other than the only, the only person that is mentioned more than him is Jesus Christ, his master, our master. So Peter was called to follow Christ in his early ministry. As we read in Mark 1, 6 to 17, if you remember, <clears throat> Jesus did not meet Apostle Peter directly and was later appointed to apostleship as we read in Mark 2, 10 to or Mark 3, 14 to 16. He said he appointed 12 disciples, that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach. Then in verse 15 of Mark 3, he said, and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the 12 he appointed, Simon, to whom he gave name Peter. So that was what we are saying, that he appointed apostleship. Jesus Christ appointed apostleship and Peter was among them. Then Christ renamed him Peter or Cephas both words meaning stone or rock. As we as we were told by John in, in John 4 42. So the Lord clearly singled out Peter for special lessons throughout the gospel, especially as we read in, in Matthew 16, 13 to 21. Matthew 16, 13 to 21. What, did, what, 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 I mean, how did Jesus Christ single him out? He said, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still, Jeremiah, others say, or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied, Better are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And in that Matthew 16, verse 18, Jesus said, And I tell you, that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hates will not overcome it, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth will be loose in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. 
now this is we are jesus christ single out peter for the gospel he was the spokesman for the 12 articulating their thoughts and questions as well as his own his triumphs and his weaknesses are chronicled in the gospel and in the book of acts as we read in as of apostle from chapter 1 to verse I mean to chapter 12 Peter played a significant role in the life of the disciples after the resurrection and the ascension Peter initiated a plan for choosing a replacement for Judas now apart from the pastors how did Peter go about choosing a replacement for Judas can somebody tell us how did Peter because who, who was the, who was the disciple that, that um, was was found wanting among the twelve can somebody give me the answer who was the disciple that fell out apart from the pastors and the elders Jesus appointed 12 disciples, but one of them fell out of grace. Who was that disciple? Hello, Ben. Okay. Can any of the pastors help me? Who was the disciple that fell out of grace, out of the 12 disciples after the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Am I communicating? Judas is carried. And after the coming of the Holy Ghost in Acts of Apostles 2, 1 to 4, he was empowered to become the leading gospel preacher from the day of Pentecost. As we read in Acts of Apostles 2, 12, he also performed notable miracles in the early days of the church. As we also read in As of Apostle chapters 3 to chapter 9. And he opened the door of the gospel to the Samaritans. How did Apostle Paul and Apostle Peter open the door of the gospel to the Samaritans? How did they open the door to the Samaritans? Apostle Peter were also sent, it was sent to two people were sent to, 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 to Samaria and Apostle, Apostle Peter was one of them and also to the Gentiles as we read also in, 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 in other Apostle 10 because in the first one in that uh, as apostle chapter chapter 8 we read that philip was in samaria and it reads that in, in as apostle 8 verses 4 to 8 it said those who had been scattered to preach the word wherever they were sent philip went down to a city in samaria and proclaimed the messiah there when the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirit came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. It was through that period that Apostle Peter was spreading the gospel through his disciple, through his team. And also, during that period, they spread the gospel to the Gentiles. As we also read in As of Apostle, verse, I mean, chapter 10. <clears throat> you all remember the story they told us about the conversion of the centurion, the, the Gentiles called Cornelius. 
Can somebody tell me who is Cornelius or who was Cornelius? And why did Apostle Peter go to the house of a Gentile when it was forbidden in those days for Jews to go into the house or how much more to enter under the roof of Gentiles? And, and, and even worse, a centurion, a Roman centurion that, that were enemies of Rome. But Peter, the head of the disciples, left Joppa, left his people to go to the house of Cornelius. Why? Can somebody tell me? What did Peter see before he was able to go to the house of Cornelius? Yes, sir. He saw a vision. That's trying. And God spoke to him mm -hmm. in that vision. And that's how he went to the centurion house because what had happened to Cornelius was really, you know, somebody who was, you know, giving arms, you know, he, he, he was, he gave arms and fasted. That's right. And God spoke to him. Somebody who visited him and God also spoke to him. Peter was in Joppa at that time. That's right. And so God spoke to him and said, do not call anything unclean because he was going to go to the house of the Gentile. That's right. He was the Roman centurion. So God sent him there to go and comfort the whole household was baptized. That's right. And so in other words, what we are learning tonight is that God is saying that salvation is not only for the children of Israel. That even the Gentiles, even the Gentiles, and that was what we, we, we read in As of Apostle 4, I mean, As of Apostle 10, the, the last verses of 44 to 46, he said, While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Ghost came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. According to tradition, Peter had to watch as his wife was crucified. According to tradition, Peter had to watch as his wife was crucified. To be quite honest, I didn't even know that Peter's wife was crucified because we didn't read much about the marital family of Peter. But here we are, say, according to tradition, that Peter had to watch as his wife was crucified. But he encouraged her with the words, Remember the Lord. Remember the Lord. And when it came time for him also to be crucified, he reportedly pleaded that he was not worthy to be crucified like his Lord but rather should be crucified upside down. And that was AD 67 to 68 years after the death of the master, which tradition says he was. Now, because of his unique prominence, there was no shortage in the early church of documents falsely claiming to be written by Peter. Because this is a man, or this was a man that everybody knew. This was a man that, that commanded authority. So, no, so nobody could even use his name to have written any 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 episode or, or in his name falsely. So that the apostle Peter is the author of First Peter, however, is certain. The material, although in this letter bears definite resemblance to his messages. In the book of Acts, the letter teaches, for example, that Christ is the stone rejected by the builder. 
Christ is the stone rejected by the builder. What do we mean by that? I mean, in Acts of Apostles 4, 10 to 11, it said it reads, Acts of Apostles 4, 10 to 11, it said, Then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. I don't know if some of you were able to see the video I posted shortly this uh, evening about Peter healing a man that has been lame for almost maybe 30 years. Um, and uh, the man was looking at Peter and John expecting to be given money. And Peter says, silver and gold I have none, but what I have, I give to you in the name of Jesus, arise and walk. And he lifted the man up, the man started walking. So they questioned Peter, by whose authority? By whose power did you do this? You are a fisherman. And he said them, he said to them, which I will want one of our pastors, especially our Vazia, to please explain to us. Because every every day we Christians we hear this, especially during the Easter or during the uh, during any of, of these uh, Christ, uh, Christians um, um ceremony that it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified but whom God raised from the dead that this man stands before you healed Jesus is now he said Jesus is the stone you builders rejected which has become the cornerstone can you please explain to us sir, what, what does it really mean Can somebody explain to us what it means, what, what, what uh, the, the scripture is saying here, that Jesus is the stone that you builders rejected and which has become the cornerstone? How can we interpret it? That's right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you look at Jesus Christ, we're also talking about the living in the temple. And, but no one recognized him as the Messiah. He was persecuted, he was rejected. You know, <laughs> he went to a lot of problems. But nobody actually acknowledged him as the Messiah, as the Savior. That's right. But he was. So, which means Joseph is more, more, more also a similar, a similar example of a cornerstone in the household of uh, Jacob, isn't he? 
Mm. So, and that Christ is you no know, respecter of persons. As we read also in Acts of Apostle 10.34, he said, then Peter began to speak. He said, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. So that's what so Peter teaches his readers to guard themselves with humility. An echo of the Lord's guiding himself with a towel and washing the disciples' feet. As we read in John 13, 3 to 5. So there are other statements in the letter similar to Christ's sayings. Moreover, the author claims to have been a witness of the suffering of Jesus Christ. As we read in, as we are going to read again in the first Peter, when we get to chapter 5, verses 1 to 5, we are going to read, we are the author claims to have been a witness of the sufferings of Christ. He said to the elders and the flock, he said, First Peter 5, 1 to 5, the elders among you, I appear as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them. Not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing this honest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders, all of you. Clothe yourselves with humility towards one another, because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. So that's what the author is saying to us here about this very unique book first peter that we are going to study in the next couple of weeks in the next couple of weeks you see in addition to these internal evidences it is noteworthy that the early christians universally recognized this letter as the work of peter the only significant doubt to be raised about peter's authorship arises from the rather classical style of greek employed in the letter very academic writing some have argued that peter being an unlearned fisherman as we were told in as apostle 4 13 could not have written in such a sophisticated greek especially in light of the less classical style of greek employed in writing of the second peter so the second peter is not as classical as the first peter so they were now thinking that who could have written it? Because Peter, Peter, Peter was, did not graduate, it's not a PhD, it's not an MSc, <coughs> and it's not um, he didn't go to any um, uh, Bible college. He graduated from the from the from, from the I mean from, from fishers of uh, fish to fishers of men. So how could he have written such a classical word, I mean, in such a, a because in those days Aramaic was their language or Hebrew, but in this one it was written in Greek, a classical Greek. So, how could it be possible? How could it be Peter? However, this argument is not without a good answer. In the first place, that Peter was unlearned does not mean that he was illiterate, but only that he was without former rabbinical training. In the scriptures. Moreover, though Aramaic may have been a Peter's primary language, Greek would have been a widely spoken second language in Palestine. So it is also apparent that at least some of the authors of the New Testament, though not highly educated, could read the Greek of the Old Testament 
Septuagint, as we have seen in James, and also in Acts 15, 14 to 18. So beyond these evidences of Peter's ability in Greek, Peter also explained it to us. As if to say Peter was, I mean, he knew that they are going to ask him or they're going to challenge the authenticity of his authorship. So he explained it in, 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 in chapter 5 of First um, Peter, verse 12. And what did he say there? He said, in, in that First Peter, chapter 5, verse 12, he said, with the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you bravely, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God, steadfast in it. So what are we saying here? That Peter explained in, 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 in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 12, that he wrote this letter by Silvanus, also known as Silas. And Silvanus was likely the messenger designated to take this letter to his intended readers. But more is implied by this statement in that Peter is acknowledging that Silvanus served as his secretary and amanuensis. Dictation was common in the ancient Roman world. Paul and Tertius and secretaries often co-aid with syntax and grammar. So Peter, under the superintendence of the Spirit of God, dictated the letter to Silvanus, while Silvanus, who also was a prophet, as we read in Acts of Apostles 15, 32 may have aided in some of the composition of the more classical Greek. If you remember, Silvanus is the same name as Silas. If you remember, we remember, if you remember Paul, Paul and Silas, so it's the same Silas we are talking about. So 1 Peter was most likely written just before or shortly after July A.D. 64, that is 64 years after the death of Jesus Christ, when the city of Rome burned. Thus, a writing date A.D. 64 to 65. So, in other words, what we are saying here, to the best of my understanding, is that if Silas was also a secretary to Peter, and we also read that the same Silas and Paul we are the ones singing in the prison, so which means that it was likely that Paul must know Peter. And, and at this time, we are not saying that when he wrote this letter it was 64 years after the death of Jesus Christ. So when you add 64 years to the age of Peter at the time that he met Jesus, so we will be thinking that Peter will now be in his 80 or in his 90 years of age. Because Apostle Paul and, and Silas, they were in prison together. So which means that Silas was more, 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 more like, a, like a Timothy to, to, to Apostle Paul in his old age. So what is the background <clears throat> and the setting that made Peter to write this book? When the city of Rome burned, the Romans believed that their emperor, Emperor Nero, had set the city on fire, probably because of his incredible loss to build. In order to build more, he had to destroy what he has already existed. What we are saying is this. We are I'm taking you to history now. Because in, 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 in that period, that, that is 64 years after the death of Jesus Christ, the Roman Empire was ruled by one ruthless and wicked emperor. They call Emperor Nero. He was a sadist, a serial killer, a cold-hearted killer. And he similarized himself to God, that they should worship him as a god. And in those days, the Romans were worshipping so many gods. They worshipped Jupiter. They worshipped so many gods. And Nero now became a god to them. And in that time, 
there was fire, 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 fire all over Rome. Rome was burning. A lot of the Roman people, they believed that the fire was deliberately set by Emperor Nero so that he could destroy the whole city of Rome and rebuild his own fashion because he was a very, very, uh, um, a, a, a very, very vain, very ruthless. So when the city of Rome was burning, the Romans believed that their Emperor Nero had set the city on fire. Probably because of his incredible loss to build. In order to build more, he had to destroy what already existed. The Romans were totally devastated. Their culture, in a sense, went down with the city. All the religious elements of their life were destroyed. Their great temples, their shrines, and even their household idols were burned up. And this had great religious implications because it made them believe that their deities had been unable to deal with this conflagration and were also victims of it. The people were homeless and hopeless. And many had been killed. Their bitter resentment was severe. So Nero realized that he had to redirect the hostility <coughs> in those days in the Rome, in the in the old Rome, almost every corner they have shrine, they have groups, they have so many idols, so many so many epitaphs, and even in their houses they have so many idols, idols, idols. All, all like like the Roman Catholic have shrines in their houses. So so it was a culture, a culture of paganism. And then when, when uh, Emperor Nero now set fire on them, he didn't tell them in advance. So he destroyed everything. He destroyed the streets. He destroyed all the groups. He destroyed all the shrines. He destroyed all their idols, even in their houses. To the extent that they were devastated, they started doubting their deities. That if their deities are really um, hearing, they ought to have averted this uh, devastation. And this was brought to, to the attention of Emperor Nero that you are losing grace because you have you have or you have really hit at the core at the core of what is holding us together religion religion and that is what we are experiencing today today you born a Quran the whole of the Muslim community will set fire to your house. And same thing goes to the Christianity too in the days of the Crusaders. <coughs> so, it was necessary for Emperor Nero now to redirect their hostility and blame somebody else for it. So the emperor's chosen scapegoat was the Christians who were already hated because they were associated with Jews and because they were seen as being hostile to the Roman culture, of course. Because Christians are not idol worshippers. So they didn't like the Romans' way of life. So they were not really friendly with them. So when Emperor Nero now said it was the Christians that were burning your houses, it was the Christians that set the whole room on fire. So what happened now? A vicious persecution against Christians began and soon spread throughout the Roman Empire, touching places not of Tyros, like Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, and impacting the Christians whom Peter called pilgrims, these pilgrims, who were probably Gentiles, for the most part, possibly led to Christ by Paul and his associates, and established on post teaching. They all scattered abroad. <clears throat> But they needed a spiritual strengthening. This Christian, this persecuted Christian, they needed spiritual strengthening because of their sufferings. If you remember, some of them were thrown into, into what we call arena, like a, 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 a circus, 
and, 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 and they were exposed to lions. So lion, lions for entertainment. So most of the senators, most of the, uh, the campanero would throw the Christians into the lion's den to watch the lion attacking these Christians and, the, and, and, and spectators to be laughing. So, 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 so as to get away from his own crime of burning their houses. So thus Apostle Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote this epistle to strengthen them. To strengthen them. Peter wrote that he, he was in Babylon. <coughs> to strengthen them. Because they were suffering. They were really suffering. They were really suffering and pain. So Peter wrote that he was in Babylon when he penned this letter down as we read in, in as we are going to do because we, 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 we I don't know who is going to be the teacher that is going to teach us in that when we, when we reach uh, uh, chapter 5 verses 12 to 13 what did Peter I mean Peter Peter was writing he said when he was in Babylon was Peter really in Babylon so that was what we are saying here was really was Peter really in Babylon? Peter was not in Babylon. But he said, that now three locations have been suggested for this Babylon. What do we mean by that? What do we mean? What did Peter say? Or what did Peter mean by writing from Babylon? Writing from Babylon. Now, Three locations have been suggested for this Babylon. First, a Roman outpost in northern Egypt was named Babylon. But that place was too obscure. And there are no reasons to think that Peter was ever there. Second, an ancient Babylon in Mesopotamia is a possibility. But it will be quite unlikely that Peter, Mark, and Sivanos, we are all at this rather small distant place at the same time because it was very far to Judea to Jerusalem and the third Babylon is an alliance for Rome it's a coin name because in those days you don't want to say Rome if you say Rome you can be you can be prosecuted you can be arrested so so they coin Rome as Babylon, they call Bab what they call Rome Babylon. Perhaps even a code word for Rome, because in terms of persecution, writers exercise unusual care not to endanger Christians by identifying them. So Peter, according to some traditions, followed James and Paul and died as a martyr near Rome about two years after he wrote this letter. Thus he had written this episode near the end of his life probably while staying in the imperial city. He did not want the letter to be found and the church to be persecuted, so he may have hidden its location under the code word Babylon, which aptly fit because of the city's idolatry. It was a, an idolatry city. The historical background. Since the believers address we are suffering escalating persecution the purpose of this letter was to teach them how to live victoriously in the midst of their hostility one how can they live because this, this is going to apply to us we are lucky in america today but some of our christian brothers are not as lucky as we are and what are we now saying that how can this letter teach us how to live victoriously in the midst of hostility one without losing hope two without becoming bitter three while trusting in our lord and four while looking for his second coming peter wished to impress on his readers that by living an obedient victorious life under duress a Christian can actually evangelize his hostile world. So no matter the persecution we may be facing in our life, 
We must never lose hope. We must never become bitter. It is easy to become bitter. And also, we must continue to trust in our Lord. And finally, we must continue to look towards His second coming. Believers are constantly exposed to a world system energized by Satan and his demons. Their effort is to discredit the church and to destroy its credibility and integrity. One way these spirits work is by finding Christians whose lives are not consistent with the word of God and then parading them before the unbelievers to show what a sham the church is. Have we not seen those things today in our life? So many pastors today in Africa. I saw one the other day. He died and said the only thing that could raise him up is the amount of dollar that they spray upon his head. So his congregation started dropping dollar, 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 dollar on top of him. Until the weight of dollar now, now about to suffocate him before he, he, he was able to rise from dead. And also about two years ago, we read about some in, 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 in Kampala or in South Africa, ordering his congregation to go and start eating grass and some drinking Jake. So these are the, the type of people that Satan wants to parade before the unbeliever to say these are the pastors. These are the, the, these are the servants of Christ. These are the, the, what we call the Holy Queens, the jesters. But we should not be discouraged by them because Jesus Christ has already told us, has already warned us that in the last days, they say many people will come in my name. Some of them will call Lord, Lord, Lord. Some of them will say we heal people in your name. We preach the gospel in your name. But Jesus will say, I never knew you. I don't know you. You workers of iniquity. He said the majority of them will be like wolves, like ravenous wolves in sheep's clothing. They have come to steal. They have come to destroy, to lead people into the gates of hell. He said you must be watchful. You must be watchful to know the true believer, to know the true shepherd. And if you remember again, Jesus Christ said that uh, <coughs> not everybody is a shepherd. He said some of them are hirelings. Hirelings means the hired hand. They are not shepherds. They are hired hands. And the, the, and the higher hands, when they hear the noise of wolves or lion, they run away and leave the sheep. But the true shepherd will stay and fight the sheep and the wolves. So Christians, however, must stand against the enemy and silence the critics by the power of holy lives. In this epistle, Peter is rather effusive in reciting two categories of truth. The first category is positive and it includes a long list of blessings bestowed on Christians as he speaks about the identity of Christians and what it means to know Christ. Peter mentions one privilege and blessing after another. Interwoven into this list of privileges is the catalog of suffering. So many privileges because Jesus Christ said, in my father's house there will be many mansions. I am going to make a way for you where I am. You will be also. So eternity is one of them. But we cannot gain eternity without suffering. So we have to suffer before we can enjoy. So the basic question that Peter answered in this epistle is how are Christians to deal with animosity? And the answer features practical truths and focuses on Jesus Christ as the model of what will maintain a triumphant attitude in the midst of hostility. He demonstrated true, he suffered for us. Because if you remember Isaiah 
53, <clears throat> and Nazar also wrote about him that he was led to the slaughter table and he opened not his mouth. He was beaten, was chastised for iniquity. The strap of his the strap of him was according to uh, according to what we read. He said was. So first Peter also answers other important practical questions about Christians living, such as do Christians need a priesthood to intercede with God for them? Do Christians need a priesthood to intercede with God for them? As we shall be reading in 1 Peter 2, 5-9. to The second question, what should be the Christian's attitude to secular government and civil disobedience? As we shall also be reading in 1 Peter 2, 13-17. And then what should a Christian employee's attitude? What should a Christian employee's attitude be towards a hostile employer? Then how should a Christian lady conduct herself? As whoever is teaching us will be teaching us in First Peter 3, 3 and 4. And finally, how can a believing wife win her unsaved husband to Christ? As we shall also be reading. In chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Now, so there are some, some challenges here. And let us see what those challenges are. We're going to read now together 1 Peter 3, 18 to 22. 1 Peter 3, 18 to 22. Inter interpretive challenges. That is, how do we interpret what Apostle Peter has written in that chapter 3. He said, in that chapter 3, verse 18 to 22, he said, For Christ also suffered once for sins, that just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, by whom he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, we are saved through water. There's also an antitype which now saves us, baptism. Not removal of the faith of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. Now, 1 Peter 3, 18-22 stands as one of the most difficult New Testament texts to translate and then interpret. For example, the Spirit in that chapter 3 verse 18 refers to Holy Spirit or to Christ's Spirit. Did Christ preach through <clears throat> Noah's before the flood? Or did he preach himself after the crucifixion? As we are told in chapter 3 verse 19, was the audience to this preaching composed of humans in Noah's days or demons in the abyss? And does chapter 3 verse 20-21 teach baptismal regeneration, salvation, or salvation by faith alone in Christ? So, 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 these are the things, these are the answers to, <clears throat> that, that we shall be finding out. You see, because one thing is, are we saved by baptism alone? Or are we saved by faith alone in Christ Jesus? So, these are all the things that we shall be learning when we come to start studying the, <clears throat> the book of, um, the book of, of, uh, 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 <clears throat> the, the, the book of uh, uh, Peter. Now, 
the, the significance and, the, and and what we learn in in, in this in this uh, we, what we are going to learn in in, in the whole chapter the, you see though it's only five chapters long first peter is an important letter for us to study since it contains a number of themes that christian disciples must master if we will serve jesus christ faithfully in our own day some of the main things include hard lessons that you may have struggle with. So in, in, in the next few weeks, we shall be studying these five principles that we have to struggle with to make sure <clears throat> that we, 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 we work upon it. One of them, appreciating our salvation rather than taking it for granted. Appreciating our salvation rather than taking our salvation for granted. Two, learning obedience and submission even though it is tough. Learning obedience and submission even though it is tough. Second and third one, practicing holiness without developing a sanctimonious smike. Practicing holiness without being hypocritical, without developing a sanctimonious smack. And then living in the world without being tainted by it. Jesus Christ told us that we don't belong to this world. We are foreigners, we are sojourners, we are pilgrims. We are passing through. So we can live through it without being tainted by it. And then, then the next one, emulating Christ's sacrificial lifestyle, so it becomes our own. Emulating Christ's sacrificial lifestyle, so it becomes our own. And then the next one, growing through our suffering rather than being defeated by them. Growing, we are allowing our suffering to, to, to make us to be thick-skinned, to, to strengthen us, to build our faith rather than being defeated by them. Then the next one, being faithful in our relationship with family, with employer, with employees, being faithful with one another. Then the next one, grasping our true identity as God's people. Grasping our true identity as God's people. Then preparing for judgment without being driven by fear. Nobody knows when God is going to say, this is the time for you for homecoming. But what we are, we are, we are saying is when God says it is time, what will God find in your hand? Nobody knows. Nobody knows tomorrow. So which means that at each point on time, we must be preparing for any day that God says it is time for us to come. So preparing for judgment without being driven by fear. And lastly, developing the character of leaders of which God can be proud. Though First Peter teaches us a lot about what God is like, it is also an intensely practical book that teaches us to grow and change in positive ways. So that ends <clears throat> the introduction to this Peter. And um, does anybody have any question? Does anybody have any question? Uh, I just want to say, um, Rambo, thank you so much for really a great survey in our big book of Boston. You know, it's quite an elaborate survey of the book of Peter, of Peter. You know, what I want to say is just to everyone on the line tonight is please, please, um, this book quite a loaded book, okay, because, you know, as Pablo said earlier, you know, Peter was called an ignorant fisherman, but he spent three years with Jesus Christ, in the school of Jesus, so he could not be ignorant, because this letter that has followed this um, epistle really confirms, you know, that Peter was not an ignorant person, because here in the first few verses of this book in chapter one, Peter deals with doctrine and handles very weighty subjects, but these are not easy subjects to deal with. 
in terms of doctrine. They are not. They are really tough subjects, you know. And he deals with, you know, um, you know, election, the doctrines of election. He talks about for knowledge, sanctification, obedience, the blood of Jesus Christ, the Trinity, the grace of God. He talks about salvation. He talks about revelation, glory, faith, and hope. Okay, so again, these these few verses are really, really, really crowded doctrine out um lessons that we're gonna learn in the next few weeks. So I, I just wanna encourage all of us to really, you know, and the teachers to really spend time to really study this very carefully because there's a lot with this book is way there. It's really way there. You know. And even the question that Pastor Lambo was asking about chapter five, that maybe chapter three with um with um in terms of Noah, I mean, again, you know, these were some kind of comparisons that have been made about what about the name and, and the drowning, and, you know. So again, those are things that we're going to find very interesting. And whether, you know, Peter was in, in Babylon or not, again, we, 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 these are things we'll get into, or we'll find out that, but I believe that he was in Babylon. You know, I know that, you know, but I believe that, and I can, I would like to do that culturally, that he actually was in Babylon because Peter was not right here. Symbolically, he was an apostle, and he talks about the church there yeah, in, 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 in Babylon. So these are all the things that we're going to really spend time to study. So I just want to say thank you so much, Pastor uh, Lambo, for this elaborate, you know, survey that you carried out on the book of First Peter. But it's a very weighty book, and I just want to encourage everyone in the Master and Christian Church to study, read this book, look for study materials, you know. And then so that when we come, we can all discuss it and we'll turn course. Because um, for me, if I'm looking for a theme for, for this, you know, for, for, for this for this book, it's, it's the Christian hope in trial time. Okay? For me, that would be the thing. Because it's really about all the Christian in trial time. How do we go through trial time? And I think that Lambo touched on that as well. So I just want to say thank you once again, Pastor Lambo, for a wonderful, wonderful survey of this book. And as I said, I just want to encourage the church, please, for those who are not on the line, just let your friends know that the few weeks ahead of us is really going to be interesting as we go through all these doctrines that Peter is talking about. And who else to talk about for Peter who was very close to Jesus Christ. Right. Amen? Amen. So that's just my contribution tonight. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question or comment? Auntie Mary? <laughs> okay, sir. Can you please? You've given us a lot to digest. Can you please see? It is a great book. It is a fantastic book. It is a great book. Yes, sir. Can you close the prayer for us, sir? Thank you. Can you, can you close us in prayer? Thank you, sir. Shall the grace together. May the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the love of God 
and the Sufi Court of Holy Spirit, rest with me in our body to us all, now and forever now. Amen. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we shall take the heart of the Lord.